Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is a woman who, I think it's fair to say, has been on a lifelong quest for identity. And here she is, Sarah Fischer. Hello, Peter. Hi. Thank you very much for joining us here on Talking Germany. Great stuff, a great privilege. Now, Zara Fischer is a traveller, a writer and a photographer who has visited most of the countries of the world on a journey dedicated to answering two questions. Who am I and where am I from? So I think it's going to be fascinating talking about those issues with her. But first of all, Zara, I'd like to begin with a question. Uh, I'm guessing that you pretty exactly know how many countries there are in the world. Well, I googled it. Ah, I, think, did uh, you indeed? <laughs> I had no idea because people kept on asking me, so how many countries have you traveled so far? Yeah. And uh, I had to count the countries that I haven't traveled so far. It was easier because um, it was only 38 countries I haven't seen in my life. 38 countries you haven't seen so far, yeah? yeah. And I, I'm guessing there's about 200 countries. I'm doing the maths quite quickly. So you visited somewhere around 160 countries. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and, I, and I said in my introduction there that you have been on a quest for identity. Is that too dramatic or is that, is no. that that's an accurate summary? Yeah? That's right, yeah, yeah. It was a search for my roots, so to say, mm -hmm. because I was adopted in Germany and um, there was paperwork, but um, I had no passport copy of my real mother. So I didn't know where she was from. I had no clue where my father was from. And that's why I started searching for my roots, for mm. my identity. Mm. And wh 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 when was all this that you began to discover this urge in yourself, this, this desire to go out there and, and, and seek your identity? I'd say unconsciously um, I traveled when I was young um, and didn't know that I'm searching for myself. And, mm. um, At the age of maybe 25, 28, um, I, I knew I'm searching for my roots, I'm searching for uh, what I want to do and um, where I come from by traveling the world. Mm -hmm. And just to, in, I mean, we're going to talk about all this in detail, but in brief, you know, what have you discovered about yourself in all your travels? Um, I discovered my home and my home is in Germany and for a long time uh, I didn't know Germany is my home even though I was born here mm -hmm. and um, because I traveled so many countries um, I felt at home in Germany I could feel here this is um, where I want to be mm -hmm. I found my that's my aim and there's a German word for home yeah that is so familiar to so many people even people who cannot speak German Heimat Heimat. Heimat, exactly, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you've had your first impressions from Zara Fischer there. Here is more. Her search for her own identity is now over. Today, if you ask Zara Fischer who she is, you'll get a simple answer. I'm Sarah, and I'm a very happy person right now. Very contented. Zara was only three weeks old when she was adopted by a German couple. Her biological parents were unknown. Back then, people often asked me, don't you want to know where you come from? Don't you want to know who your real mother was? And after a while, I started believing that I needed to know where I come from. But it was more of an external pressure. To begin with, I wasn't really all that interested in finding out more. That came later. Eventually, Fischer decided to embark on a search for her roots. She journeyed across the world in search of a place where she might have been born. When she reached Mongolia, she felt a deep bond with the country and its people. When I first arrived there, and the people accepted me right away, I had the feeling I'd found my home, the place where I belong. My heart, my instincts, my gut feeling told me I'd found where I came from. 
When Fisher was 25 years old, a genetic test showed that her biological mother came from the Philippines. But nowadays, Fisher says she feels like a Bavarian. I like all the food from Germany, and especially Bavaria. I've tried many different cuisines, Vietnamese, Thai, Asian, but the spices don't really suit me. The lemongrass, soy sauce, coriander leaves, I don't like the taste of them. I like sausages and schnitzel and all the Bavarian specialities. She owns nine Dirndls. She met Ralph at the Oktoberfest. They're expecting their first child in January. He's a real Bavarian. He grew up here in Bogenhausen, and that's where his roots are. He belongs here, and that was important to me. I wanted my husband to have roots, real roots. <laughs> I was unconsciously searching for my own roots, my identity, my origins. I've only recently realized that I was actually searching for myself, for who I am as a person. And I found peace. Germany is my home. It's where I'm from and I belong here. My search is over and I've arrived home. And today she's our guest on Talking Germany, Zara Fischer. It's a wonderful story. Let's go back to your childhood in Germany's southwest. So tell, tell me a little, bit of, uh, a little bit more about what it was like growing up there. Well, I grew up in uh, Freiburg in the Black Forest near the Swiss border. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a very good childhood. My parents, they love me. I love my parents. They made everything possible for me. Um, it's a beautiful place to live. Um, yeah, and um, I'm happy uh, when I think about what I, how I grew up. Sounds wonderful. Uh, of course, you weren't growing up with your biological parents, and I'd like to ask you how important that is, because I know for some people who don't know their parents when they're growing up, it's the paramount question for them. They want to meet their father, they want to meet their mother, and for other people, they say, it's not, it's not a big deal. Well, what was it like for you? Um, for me, it wasn't, um, I didn't have the desire to meet my parents. Um, the only question that interested me was finding out where I'm from, where, where's my mother from. Um, if you are asked where do you come from, you look Asian. I couldn't tell the people I'm from Japan or I'm from China and this was important to me. Mm. And how did you go about trying to find, I mean what routes did you take to try and find out where you were from? First of all, I was searching for my roots in Germany for mm -hmm. about 13 years. I contacted all the embassies and the institutions. Um, 13 years? Altogether, it Star was 13 starting years at what of age? searching. This was, a, this was what, starting in your 20s? When I was 18, I and got all the paperwork yeah? and started mm -hmm. searching for mm -hmm. my roots. And um, it wasn't possible in, in Germany. And then I extended my search uh, into Asia and traveled Asia for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you went to the Philippines, but you came up against a bit of a sort of a wall there. The, 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 the journey didn't quite continue. You didn't get what you were looking for. Well, the Philippines was one of the Asian countries that I traveled um, to search for my roots. And um, no, I didn't feel at home. I didn't find a sign in the Philippines, um, some hint that I might be there, from there. Well, how might that sign have manifested? What, what would that sign have been? Um, what exactly were you looking for or trying to feel you know, or trying to hear? Yeah, yeah I, I wasn't really looking for something, but I was hoping um, that I blend in somehow. Yeah. Or um, maybe I like some special food. Maybe it's easy for me to pick up the language in an Asian country. All of this I was hoping to find. Mm -hmm. you, you were very, very patient. You took a long time about this search for your identity. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you finally found what you were looking for. And how did you know that you had found it? You talked about the signal. You talked about a sign. Yeah, you talked yeah. about how you would know that you, you had found it. How did you, when that came to pass? Um, I'd say this was uh, in Mongolia when I... Uh, arrived in Mongolia uh, was a different situation than in all the other Asian countries that I've been to before. Um, I really blended in and the people um, thought I'm Mongolian. They wouldn't ask me, where are you from? 
and they spoke to me in Mongolian. Um, at that point, I couldn't speak any Mongolian language at all. Um, and I was accepted by them right away. Mm. And this was the first nation where this happened to me in mm. Mongolia. When we talk about identity, because we've used this word identity, how do you actually, how do you define it for yourself? Because I know it's something you've written about, you've thought about a lot. How do you actually define the term identity? Um, it's my country of origin, mm. where my roots are, where my mother is from, mm. and um, maybe also where my heart is. Mm. It's interesting because you went on this very long quest looking for yourself and at some stage it became a way of life. It became the way you actually began to earn a living. How did that transition work out? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, it was a difference. I think uh, some or most of the people that are traveling, they are searching for something. And I guess young people that are traveling when they've finished high school, um, they are searching for uh, what can I do for a living. And um, unconsciously for me, it was just traveling, but looking back, I think it was a search for, for myself. Okay, so let's, uh, I think we've got one or two photos that we could have a look at of you on your travels. And maybe you could just, let's have a look there and you could tell us exactly what we're seeing. Yeah, that's the, uh, the Chinese wall. I travel yeah. China extensively. Um, and um, yeah, it was actually funny with some Americans that I met. We went on a go-kart trip and uh, kind of forgot about traveling, uh, walking on the Great Wall and did this only the next day. There are not many people around there. Normally the Great Wall is much more populated than that. What time of day was that? Yeah. Hmm? Well, this is a part of the Chinese wall where less people go to. Uh, I think it was um, instead of Bada Ling, it was Jincha Ling. Mm -hmm. and, um, but uh, the other part of the Chinese wall, there's more tourists and even uh, especially in the daytime. OK, I, I think people watching the show would be asking themselves because you're talking about this long period of traveling that you've been, that you would you were engaged in. Yeah, people will be asking themselves, how on earth did she finance it all? Uh, excuse How me, did you finance it all? Well, um, in the beginning, traveling for more than a year was only possible when I worked in between. So I kind of spent a long time in every country working to, in order to, to continue to travel again. And uh, at some point, I got a huge redundancy of a company in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, which allowed me to travel three years in a row. That's pretty good going. OK. <laughs> uh, Sarah isn't the only uh, German who loves to travel. It's uh, really something of a national pastime. What's more, there's a huge market here for professional travellers who go out into the world and put their adventures and their impressions together in a form of spectacular photo shows. It's a mini industry, in fact, uh, with its own trade fair called Mundologia. For the next two days, Lily Wagner is going to leave her everyday life behind and sit in darkened lecture halls to find out more about distant reaches of the globe at the Mundologia Festival of Photography and Multimedia in Freiburg. The lecture on the Philippines by local photojournalists Tobias Hauser and David Hettich is sold out. There are well over a thousand people in the audience, among them Lily Wagner. <laughs> They can turn their heads 180 degrees in both directions. When you see everything presented so wonderfully on the screen, you get the feeling the world is a fascinating place and you feel happy to be a part of it. The images and stories are as powerful as any feature-length film. Suddenly we're seeing more and more crucifixions, but it all seemed a bit alienating to me when I was taking the pictures. The lecture is also a rediscovery of the pleasures of slowness. A photograph is not like television. It's more powerful because it doesn't move. It's not like a film where the images are changing constantly, second by second, so no single image has much of an effect. When you spend 10 seconds gazing into the face of a child, a child who's gazing back at you, that touches your heart. 
The beauty and impact of the images have made multimedia lectures extremely popular with audiences, at festivals and elsewhere. The smoke burns your eyes, and as you can see from this man here, it's extremely hard work too. Audiences in Freiburg are convinced that the power of photography can compete with anything television or the movies have to offer. Lorenz Fischer from Switzerland spent 14 years traveling across Africa. His spectacular photographs are accompanied by exciting stories. Then they're off for their tireless, restless search for food. They're awfully cute, these meerkats. <laughs> After I've spent two days here admiring the beauty of the world, I have a lot more energy for my everyday life. I spend the weekend soaking up energy for the next days, or even the weeks ahead. And most of the audience members at Mundologia would agree with that. For those who don't have the time or money to journey to distant places, it's a way to tour the world at home in Freiburg. Sorry, you mentioned already Freiburg. It's where you come from originally. I'm sure you know this festival very well. Oh, yes, yeah. Two colleagues of mine, they are doing this festival. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about it. Um, well, this is my main profession, uh, mm -hmm. doing these shows. And um, the people that are organising these festivals, um, they, uh, they book us with our shows. It doesn't only exist in Freiburg, but in every other big city in Berlin, Hamburg, Cologne, Frankfurt. And I think it's a typical German phenomenon. Uh -huh. <laughs> People paying money, an entrance fee, to um, hear about the adventures of people standing in front of them on stage. Um, why, do, why do you say that's typically German? Um, because it doesn't exist in other countries. It's true, because so when I started, when I watched this report before the show, I sat and I looked at it and I said to myself, does that happen in other countries? And I couldn't really think of an example that came to mind. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, lots of people asked me already, why does this exist in Germany? How come people are paying an entrance fee to hear about your adventures? They can travel by themselves. Well, what, they... What's your answer to the question? <sighs> well, what did I say so far? Um, you have to go back, maybe 30 years back, um, there were no guidebooks, no internet. And so people would go to these slideshows in order to find out, uh, is it possible to, to buy a train ticket in China if mm. I'm a foreigner, for example. That's how they got their information. Yeah. And, um, and then it developed into these uh, live shows now mm. with a beamer. And do you, do you think the people who are coming along, do you think that they're mainly people who are coming along to, to, to get that kind of information for a possible future journey, or are they people who are coming along, they can't afford perhaps a journey to an exotic place and they want to see what it looks like without being able to go there? I'd say most of the people that are going to these shows, they either want to travel the country in the mm. near future or they've traveled the country already and want to see how the guy who's standing on stage is talking about this country. Mm. Tell me about the shows that you do. How do you put them together? How long does it take? How does it work? Well, my show about Mongolia um, exists 12 years now and every year I'm adding new stories that mm. I um, do in Mongolia and um, it's a 90-minute show. It's quite um, a long time. Yeah. Well, it used to be 120, wow. but um, <laughs> yeah, I think 90 minutes is a, is a good length. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's just so much fun standing on stage telling the people about my favourite country, about my friends in Mongolia, how mm. they're living. Mm. It's, it's interesting because you need to have two skills, in essence. You, have to, you need to be a storyteller and you need to be able to take pretty decent photos. Yeah. And you need to know how to program the show and um, yeah, much mm. more. You, in the beginning, the first four years, you have to hang, out, hang up the posters by yourself, do the press and marketing work and hire all the uh, locations, whatever. Mm. Yeah. So let, let's talk about Mongolia. Yeah, you've mentioned Mongolia already. You've mentioned how you feel at home there, how your heart beats there. Uh, what, let's begin at the beginning. Well, what is the fascination of Mongolia for you? Um, for me, it's the people, my uh, friends. Um, it's a Mongolian family, nomads um, in the steppe that are living there. And um, yeah, for me, people, they uh, reflect the country. And I'm always interested in the people in a country. And mm -hmm. they're so warm-hearted. Warm 
And um, I feel like them. I feel like a Norman my whole life already. Yeah. And um, they accepted me as one of their children. Yeah. Let's have a look at some photos of Mongolia and, uh, and uh, the kind of things you're talking about here, Zara. And then tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here. Yeah, that's Intan, an eagle hunter. And um, I go hunting with him and his eagle for the past 12 years in the Altai Mountain. It's one of the big mountain ranges in Mongolia. And there's camels living in these uh, circumstances. This is in the Gobi Desert. Uh, there's a camel festival in March every year. And this is the little daughter, uh, Zolo, of my Mongolian uh, family. Mm -hmm. This is a um, monastery in the northern part of Mongolia. Yeah, all the wow. uh, Munk Nassan. Wonderful, wonderful images. Uh, <laughs> t t tell me about the family. Tell me, when, when you say it is my family, what does that mean? They've adopted you? Well, yeah, not officially, but yeah. um, I, I'm just one of them. Um, I've got sisters and brothers there. They call me Sarah. It's the uh, Mongolian translation for Sarah. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm part of their family life. I have to do the same work every other child is doing there. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the nomadic existence, what does that, what, what does that actually mean? Um, well, it's a hard life, um, living there as a nomad from their livestock. Uh, especially in winter, uh, it gets very cold. Um, there's not so much snow, mm -hmm. but the whole aim for the nomads is surviving the winter. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, the livestock has to survive, so then the people can survive, and that's the only problem, the only challenge they've got every year. Mm. And it means literally, I mean, it's a nomadic existence, it means moving around from one place to another. How does that work? Well, at least five, six, seven times they, the nomads are moving in order to find better pastures for their livestock. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's exactly my way of life. I used to <laughs> move around very often. Uh -huh. and, you li um, and when you're there, you live in a gur, in a tent that can be taken up and put back. It's, pretty, it's more than a tent, really. It's a, it, it's a gur, yeah? It's a gur. I think it's a Russian word from Russian the word. Turk yeah. language or mm -hmm. so. And, um, yeah, in winter I stay with my family inside the gur, and in summer I very often sleep outside or in my tent. Mm -hmm. And how, how long does it take to, uh, to put up a gur and to take a, a gur back down when, you, when you're moving around? Is, Is it a day's fast? work? Uh, no, if you're fast, you can set it up in one and a half hours. Oh, wow. Yeah. And said putting it down is even faster. Okay. And in, 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 I mean, you're, you're telling me about the lifestyle of other people. What have you learned about yourself while you've been there in Mongolia? Um, you don't because... need much to be happy. <laughs> but I knew this <laughs> before I traveled Mongolia already. Uh -huh. um, you really, you're happy with nothing. Yeah. As long as you're healthy and you've got enough water <clears throat> to drink and some food, that's all you need. It's interesting when you're talking about the lessons you've learned and the fact that you've spent an awful lot of time there. You've been going back and forth for a, 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 a many, many years now. You're actually called here in Germany Die Bayerische Mongolin, the, uh, the Mongolian from Bavaria. How do you feel about that? I think it's, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a good expression. Um, so people know who I am. And uh -huh. um, yeah, it's a nickname which uh -huh. the media gave me already. When you were a young girl, we've talked about you growing up in Germany, down in Southwest, down in, Fre in, in Freiburg, yeah. Um, were you an adventurous type back then? Not at all. Not at all? I was a very shy child. You were shy, you were timid. Yeah, uh, yeah and I was scared about new things and, um, uh -huh. yeah, a different way of life uh, than oh. I developed. And now you are a hardened, seasoned traveller who fears nothing. That's maybe <laughs> a bit exaggerated, no. <laughs> I'm still scared about things and sometimes uh, before I started my travels and I sat in a plane or a bus, I thought to myself, what am I doing here? And um, oh my God, I don't know where I'm going to sleep tonight. Yeah. Uh, Zara is 40 years old and uh, she's recently uh, had a ch her first child, a daughter in fact. Not too long ago that would have been unusual, but as we see now, uh, there's a trend here in Germany for women to wait longer and longer before having their first child. She's finally pregnant with twins. For Sylvia Peterson, it's a dream come true. But because she's 47 years old, there's also a health risk. That's why she's getting intensive monitoring at the prenatal clinic. 
I know it's a risk. Being pregnant at my age is high risk, and it's also high risk for the babies. So I'm doing everything I can to minimize that risk, and I'm very grateful to my doctors. Peterson first concentrated on her career. Later, when she wanted to have a child, it took a while. She's part of a growing trend. It used to be rare to see women over 40 in the delivery room, but today it's a weekly event. What's really striking is the fact that we're also seeing more women over 45, 47 or even 49 having babies these days. Older mothers mean high-risk pregnancies. They need to be monitored more carefully and that's led to rising costs, including after the baby is born. We have to realize that it will be a bit more expensive. There are problems that need treatment. The pregnancy needs close monitoring. Often there's genetic testing, and all that costs money. Sylvia Pedersen is already having trouble catching her breath. Her twins take up a lot of room. But despite the increased risk, she's still thrilled that she'll soon be a parent. Although what we're talking about here is late motherhood, delayed motherhood. I, you know, uh, what's your definition, Sarah, of, of late? How do we, you know, when is late? Uh, well, from my doctor, I was always told, oh, um, you're having your child uh, very late because you'll be 40 by the time you have your child. Um, but there is no late. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, for myself, I couldn't imagine um, having a baby earlier. I wanted to still experience so many things, write my book, um, yeah, still travel a lot. And mm. for me, it wouldn't have been possible to have a baby earlier, but it's got its pros and cons, having a baby when you're young or when you're older. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, you, you've now got a young daughter. She's three months old. How have people, have, have people been reacting to the fact that you are 40 and have a daughter? Or just, do, do people act as though it's the, the most normal thing in the world? Because in many parts of the world, it wouldn't be so normal. Well, there were different reactions. Some people, they said it's no problem to have a baby when you're so old. Some people, they said, oh, my God, this is dangerous and you're so old and it's a risk. And um, all these questions involved in being a late mother. Mm. It's very much, a, it is a German issue, though, that, that more and more women are waiting later and later to have their first child. Do you have an explanation for, what, for why that is in general here in Germany? Um, well, maybe the women in Germany, they uh, want to fulfill their uh, wishes um, in their professions, first of all. Mm -hmm. And um, in my opinion, it's, it's, a, it's a good decision um, to first do everything in life what you want to do. And then if it's still possible to mm -hmm. have a baby when you're that old, it's great. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's not always possible. Mm -hmm. um, I'm grateful that it worked out. Yeah, absolutely. And we heard in that report about the health risks. You've mentioned the p possible health risks. How did, how did you deal with that? I mean, you said that your, do that your doctor had possibly warned you of those risks. What mm -hmm. steps did you take or what advice did you take? Um, I mean, there is this possibility of doing tests in the 16th week, I guess, yeah. which I did because I'm of the opinion if it's possible, why... Um, why don't I do it then? Mm -hmm. and, um, but it took me a long time, a couple of weeks, to um, decide for myself, um, do I want to do it or not? Mm -hmm. And um, I always thought I'm very easy and cool. And when it came to this decision, um, yeah, I had sleepless nights and didn't right. know what to do. I can imagine, I can imagine. We're talking about having babies and we're talking, or you having a child, and, we're and we've been talking about Mongolia. And we like to ask our guests to bring along something that is precious to them, and you have done. I'm going to give it to you now, yeah? yeah. And you can perhaps tell us exactly what it is and what the connection is, yeah? <laughs> yeah, uh, I have to start. Uh, yeah, my, my, my Mongolian family, they uh, gave it to me as a present. It's, uh, it symbolizes a Mongolian wrestling costume, which is normally, of course, bigger. Um, <laughs> this is the uh, national sport in Mongolia, just like soccer with us here in Germany. I didn't know that. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah and um, they gave it to me because uh, they were hoping that I have a child at some point uh, in Mongolia, like in lots of different countries, lots of other countries, people are of the opinion, um, 
you have to have a child in order to be happy. And they were worried that I'm not a happy woman. And uh, for 10 years, I never had children. And um, actually, uh, yeah, they were successful. Now I have a baby. And this was the, uh, was the aim of give, by giving me this costume. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. Now, uh, for a long time, I think there was an, an, an aspect of the story that you've been telling us, of the journey that you've been on, there was an aspect of restlessness about that. No? Sorry, I didn't get the Restlessness. Question. You were a sort of a restless oh, yeah, person, yeah? yeah? <laughs> Your eyebrows went up. I thought you were going to tell me, no, not me, not restless. But now, now, you're settling down. That's right, yeah, because of my baby. But, uh, yeah, being restless... Does it frighten you? Does it frighten you to settle down? No, no, no. I'm happy that I've got the uh, uh, capability of settling down mm -hmm. after doing all these travels. I don't think it's so easy to all of a sudden settle down and not to travel anymore. Mm -hmm. OK. You've been, you've been all the way around the world. You've come back. You're living in Bavaria now. You, uh, you've got a child. There's a father to the child. <laughs> you met the father not in the steppes of Mongolia, yeah, but in Bavaria at the Oktoberfest, yeah. the big, the big beer party. Yeah, <laughs> tell us about that. <laughs> well, that was in 2011, and um, well, the first day of the Oktoberfest, um, I usually spend in a certain tent, Hakka tent. Oh, you have your own tent that you go to regularly. Yeah? Uh, absolutely, yeah. There's Whoa. 14 different tents, <laughs> and um, uh, the Italians go to a special tent. The Australians, the Germans, the young Bavarians, the old Bavarians, um, and for some, at some point, I changed the tent and I went to a tent where I usually never go to and that's where I met my husband now. Mm -hmm. So it was fate, it was destiny. It was fate, absolutely, yeah. That because took you to that beer tent on that day. Maybe, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually a beer garden because it was, uh, the sun was shining and we were outside. Oh, there you go. OK, the Oktoberfest, uh, which has a fair claim to being the biggest party in the world, and it's also an ideal opportunity to parade traditional Bavarian costumes, including, for the ladies, what's called the Dirndl. <laughs> a photo shoot for an autumn-winter collection. Lola Paltinger designed her first Dirndl 13 years ago. That was when traditional garments started becoming fashionable again. The dirndl is part of the Bavarian way of life. Everyone wants to be part of it and really feel that they belong. And that includes the proper outfit. The trend was also on display at this year's Oktoberfest. Folklore enthusiasts and ordinary visitors enjoy it. The women don a dirndl and the men lederhosen. I'm wearing this costume to display my loyalty to Munich and Bavaria. I wear it because it's a mustard Oktoberfest. <laughs> it's not just for the Oktoberfest. I wear a dirndl every Sunday. Simone Eger from Munich University is interested in the history of the dirndl. The costume library in Munich is an important source of information. What's surprising is that the Dirndl is not so old after all, and it doesn't have rural origins. It became a fashionable city garment in the late 19th century. It must have been invented by a clever seamstress. She took what was a simple garment worn by maids in the countryside and reinvented it using checks and florals. So she took what were basically work clothes and turned them into a festive outfit. Back in the 1950s, the traditional costume looked a bit different than it does nowadays. That was also when the first parades displaying the Derndl took place, always on the first Sunday of Oktoberfest in Munich. And the same parade still exists today, still featuring the traditional outfits. But by the 1960s, the modern Derndl began to take over. The Derndl reinterprets the historical costume. The Dirndl is now the must-have item for ladies at the Oktoberfest. Just before the event kicks off, customers flock to Lola Paltinger's shop. 
Originally based on a servant's costume from Bavaria, the Dirndl is now a trendsetter. Great stuff. Now, Zara has just been telling me, you said you're not interested in fashion especially, but the Dirndl. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why do you like them so much? I don't know what it is. Um, I think they look great mm -hmm. and um, you can get them very cheap, second hand. Cheap. Yeah. Really? How much um, does a Dirndl cost? Um, well, I've got nine Dirndl. And You've got nine Dirndls. Most of them mm. were maximum 40 euros. 40 second euros? Second hand, old ones, vintage Dirndl, really? yeah. Where, where do you buy a second hand Dirndl? Either on the flea market or in a second hand shop. Oh, yeah. yeah. And why, you, you, have, you have nine Dirndls, yeah? Why do you, why do you have so many? So embarrassing, you shouldn't admit you've got nine dinners, really. Um, uh, in Bavaria, in Munich, that's OK. That will go down very, very well indeed. <laughs> no, I picked them up um, on the way um, because I like them so much. And mm. um, it's 15 days of Oktoberfest every year, so you, one for two days. And if you go there every day. You live more or less across the road from the Oktoberfest, yeah? yeah? yeah. And so you pop down in the afternoon or in the evening. In the morning, yeah. In the morning? Yeah. Really? Yeah, mm -hmm. for the Weisswurst breakfast and... And a, and, a, and a pot of beer? Maybe two or three or four pots of beer. In yeah. the morning? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For your Weisswurst breakfast you need a <laughs> Weiss beer and... Uh, and you're wearing your Dirndl? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's kind of a catwalk, so to say. <laughs> Where do you keep all these Dirndls? Do you have a special Dirndl cupboard? No, unfortunately, no. Yeah. Um, they're in a in a bag and really? um, I have to iron them every year before the Oktoberfest starts. Uh, you really need a walk-in dirndl cupboard, yeah? <laughs> yeah. So uh, you, you go to a, so you go down to the Oktoberfest in the morning, you have a couple of uh, pots of beer, you have, uh, you have a Weisswurst, yeah? Mm, yeah. What is a Weisswurst? Oh, that's a typical Bavarian sausage mm -hmm. and... Um, it's a veal sausage. It's I veal, it yeah. uh, should be veal mm -hmm. and... Uh, no horse or so inside, yeah. and um, a pretzel with it and a beer and oh. some sweet mustard. Yeah. yeah. There are different ways of eating a Weisswurst. Yeah, you can either zutzel it, um, I don't know how Zutzel to describe it. If you don't use a knife and fork and you just nibble you on it. You suck it? You suck it, yeah. yeah. Um, or the tourists, they use knife and fork and they cut them just like a bratwurst. And do you zutzel? Um, sometimes, not always. It's messy, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what about your what about your husband? Does he? Uh, I mean, if you're wearing a dirndl, yeah, what does he wear? Does he wear traditional Bavarian gear? Does he have nine pairs of lederhosen? No, he's he's not. Uh, he he's got only one pair of lederhosen. Mm -hmm. And I just gave him one for his birthday. I read <laughs> somewhere that your husband is a typical Bavarian. Yeah. yeah. What it, what is a typical Bavarian? Well, um, he was born in Munich, mm -hmm. and that's very rare. You don't meet many people that are born in Munich. Um, there's mostly foreigners that live in Munich. And um, he just likes Weisswurst and Schnitzel and uh, Pretzel like me as well. <laughs> 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 um, and he looks Bavarian, and he's got the typical dialect. Yeah. You've got your young daughter now, and we've talked a little bit about identity, and we've talked about how identity comes together. What are you going to tell your daughter about her identity? Well, I don't think there's much uh, to tell her, because she knows where she's from. She's half German, or, yeah, no, she's a quarter Philippine. Exactly, it's quite, it's uh, a complicated mix, nevertheless. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I don't think she, she, she wants to know about it, because it's so obvious. In her case, she knows where we are from, her parents. Mm. And do you think the Germany that she grows up in is going to be a very different Germany from the Germany that you grew up in? Mm, not really. I don't think so. Mm, no. I'm interested by that answer. Of all the countries that you have not visited, which one is top of your list? Mm, nothing. Nothing? No, no, no. I don't have to see the remaining countries. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I want to discover Germany more. It's got beautiful places here in my home country. Too true. A beautiful, a beautiful, beautiful country. Lots of... Uh, the, the cities are great, the landscapes are great. Last question. 
Of all the countries that you've visited, which is the strangest country? The strangest pool. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I don't find countries strange. Um, really, I don't. I couldn't think of one. <laughs> Okie dokie. We're going to move on to our traditional Talking Germany quiz at the end of the show. Yeah. yeah? I'll give you alternatives, yeah? You give me an answer. Quickish answer, yeah? Uh, let's begin with this one. Travel or tourism? Travel. The green meadows of Bavaria or the green grasslands of eastern Mongolia? The green meadows of Bavaria. Oh, <laughs> you are a Bavarian. <laughs> a Bavarian Weisswurst or Mongolian lamb? Oh, Weisswurst, of course. <laughs> Where would you rather sleep? In a, in a gur? Yeah? Or, as they're called in Mongolia, as we have learnt, or in the next five-star hotel? In a gur. Oh, good for you. Are you, uh, are you a nomad or a settler? Uh, I hope I'll become a settler now. Which word excites you most, Heimat or adventure? Heimat. Heimat. I thought that's what you might say. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the <clears throat> she really is a Bavarian. If you've enjoyed uh, her visit to the show, the seeking, questing and the finding, Zara Fisher. If you've enjoyed the visit, then come back next week. And if you'd like to find out a little bit more, then check out my blog on the Talking Germany website. Bye-bye. <laughs>